My name is Sarah Byrne Martelli, and I'm introducing this workshop for session six. It's called Building Bridges or Barriers, the impact of social media on connecting with ourselves, each other, and God. To present today, we have Randa Karadshi Anderson, who is a licensed clinical psychologist, PhD. She's in private practice of psychology for the Orthodox Christian Counseling Institute. And she's a member of Saints Peter and Paul Greek Orthodox Church here in Glenview. We have Catherine Kredikos, MD, who is a licensed physician and chief of the section of infectious diseases for Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center. And she's the director of infectious diseases for Howard Brown Health. She's a physician and consultant at AIMMC and HBH and a member of this church as well. And we have Helen Kredikos Theodoropoulos, PhD, who's an adjunct professor for St. Sava Serbian Orthodox School of Theology and also a member of Saints Peter and Paul. So please give them a and warm the welcome. Newly elected Secretary of OTSA. And the newly elected Secretary of OTSA, congratulations. Thank you, Sarah. All three of us who are members here at Saints Peter and Paul welcome you to this, I think, last workshop of the day. Glad you're all awake. Hopefully we are too, mostly. Um, as you can see by our title, we're going to talk about um, the impact of social media uh, on connecting. And um, although we are going to focus more on some of the problems with social media today and how they're negatively impacting our relationships, we do want to say up front that all three of us see value in using social media, but we also see that, and I'll explain later, you know, it's all moving so fast. And we feel like we all just need to sort of take a step back, look at how we are all using our social media, how it's impacting us on the levels of mind, body, and soul. So that's what we're going to take a look at today. And we're going to start with a little exercise. I was told workshops should be interactive, and especially at the end of the day. So um, what you have on your chair, and if you sat down without one, please, there's more copies up here at, front, at the front. I'm not bothered if you come grab one. Um, we're going to start with a little assessment. Um, we know everyone in this room is a care provider of some kind, um, whether you um, are a therapist or a doctor or a nurse or um, in pastoral care of some sort, a priest um, or so many roles in this room. Um, you know, we all have to look at how um, our own thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are impacting, and so. Here's a little exercise for you to reflect on these questions on that sheet. Um, reflect on your own social media use. If you do not use social media, I'm pretty sure you know someone who does. And I want you to think about someone you know who maybe has a problem with their social media use. Maybe you've made some observations that either in a client or a parishioner, or maybe someone in your own family. Um, so if it's not really necessary for you to reflect on your own use because you don't really use it. Think about someone else you know. So some of these questions, um, again, they're on your sheet. I'll read through them real quickly. Um, do others ever complain about how much time you spend online? Do you skip out on social events to spend time with others? Do you avoid other activities to stay online? Do you prefer to talk to people via a social media app versus in person? In potential conflict, do you text or send a message rather than call or talk to the person face to face? Do you get irritated when someone interrupts your time on your device? Do you find yourself missing out on a memorable family moment because your device consumes your attention? Do you feel the need or urge to respond to text, emails, or social network alerts when you're in the presence of family or friends? Do you feel anxious if you were without access to your phone for two hours? Do you compare your life to others' lives via social media and posts? Do you find it difficult to sit alone with your thoughts in prayer or meditation without a device for 30 minutes or more? So those are things to reflect on. I'll give you a moment. These questions are all taken from um, both scientifically validated assessment tools on social media um, and internet use, as well as um, 
others that maybe aren't uh, scientifically validated, but are useful <coughs> tools, I think. Um, because as we walk through this presentation today, I really want all of us to think about how, um, how we can be looking at uh, the use of social media by the people that we are providing care to. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> All right, just real quick. Um, I wanted to find social media very quickly uh, and make sure that we're all clear. We're not just talking about Facebook or Instagram, right? Social media are really any websites or apps that allow users to create and share content um, or network socially, and that's everything, including YouTube, Pinterest, um, Reddit, Twitter, all of those. Um, although I will clarify that most of the research that is done is largely done on Facebook in particular. And why is that? A little background here real quick. Facebook has over 2.41 billion monthly users, over 1.49 billion daily users. Oops. The world has about 7.7 .7 billion people, which means that over a one third of the world is on Facebook. If Facebook were a country, it would be more populated than China. There are more Facebook accounts than cars in the world. And again, I make that point um, because social media use is so ubiquitous, ubiquitous that we need to be taking a look at what we're doing. All right. Let's jump right in. I'm gonna start talking fast because I realize, oh my gosh, it goes by real fast. All right, so we wanna look at what does, um, how does social media use, how is it related to loneliness in particular, right? We're talking about isolation. Loneliness is sort of that bad feeling you get when you feel socially isolated. Um, and there are two basic hypotheses. And the first is that social media use um, displaces our time spent in real world relationships and therefore causes loneliness. Uh, and on the contrary, there's the hypothesis that it stimulates or enhances our social relationships. Um, and we're gonna look at um, data related to both of those. In terms of the displacement hypothesis, some factors um, impacting social media use and loneliness taken from a study um, of over 1,700 young adults in 2017, we see that participants who use social media for more than two hours a day were twice as likely to report that they felt socially isolated, more socially isolated than their peers who spent less than 30 minutes a day on social media. The number of visits makes a difference too. Participants who visited social media platforms 58 times or more a week were three times more likely to report feelings of social isolation than those who use social media less than nine times a week. Now I know 58 times a week sounds like a lot, but if you figure that most young adults are checking their phones between 85 and 150 times a day, 58 checks on social media is actually not very much. I'm, in the interest of time, I am not gonna talk about every single data point, but the thing to point out in general is that um, there are, there's a lot of data looking at basically every angle of how social media use might displace our real world relationships. Most of those will find some um, relationship between social media use and loneliness. The stimulation hypothesis that, um, that looks at factors that might actually enhance relationships and decrease loneliness in a nutshell, find that things like access to online support groups um, actually can be helpful. Um, many people forge new relationships uh, online. And um, interestingly, you know, we've had dating apps around for years, Match.com, eHarmony, those are old websites, right? Now we have Tinder and Bumble. Um, what the data is showing is that when those connections move to the real world, the quality of the relationship is actually just as good as, as if you had met the person initially in person. Um, my husband and I went to two different weddings this summer that were the result of a match made, um, I think on, I don't know which website, but, um, 
and again, the data is showing that the quality of those relationships is actually just as good. So the bottom line, this is the slide I will not speed over because these are your take home points from me. When social media is used to enhance existing relationships or create new relationships, it is associated with less loneliness, but only when online and offline worlds overlap. When social media is used to replace real world relationships, it is associated with increased loneliness. And so those are the two points that you want to think about with the people you provide care to. When you listen to how they are using their social media, you want to pay attention to whether they are um, you know, connecting in the real world as well or hiding in some way. And I apologize because of the time. I did not dig as deeper into the data um, as I wanted to, but I would be more than happy to share resources with any, anyone here. Real quick, uh, in terms of the underlying mechanisms, why? Why, does, uh, why is there this correlational relationship between loneliness and social media use? And there are three that typically come out. The first, of course, obviously, social comparisons and envy. We look at what other people are doing online. Um, and you know, if you're already prone to loneliness or sadness, that's going to make it worse. You, you will compare. Feeling excluded, you know, this is the typical example of especially a teenager seeing a group of kids at a party, um, all those pictures of them having fun, and they feel left out because they were not there. But I do want to take a second and talk about the third point. And it's, it's really interesting. Often people think that if they go online and start scrolling through Facebook, that it'll make them feel better in some way. They make what's called an affective forecasting error. They think they're going to feel better than they actually do. And what's really interesting is that when researchers look at why they feel worse after being online, it's because they actually perceive their time spent online as worthless and meaningless, which I know Dr. Helen's going to pick up on that point later. So that, that definitely contributes. I'm going to skip my last slide in interest of yours. I do not want, I don't want Helen to have the, the two minute presentation. So I'm going to stop there um, and again just emphasize my point that how people use social media um, makes all the difference. So, all right. You're up, Kathy. Um, okay, so we decided to split the presentation really looking at isolation, violence, and then hope and communion, the topic for the conference. Uh, into our three different specialties. So um, I am really looking at violence, and we thought it would be very interesting to look at whether violence um, with relation to social media actually can lead to physical violence. As a physician, um, I actually deal with people who uh, 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 deal with a large uh, gay, lesbian, transgender population, homeless, uh, people who are addicted to a variety of substances, people who trade sex for drugs, uh, a whole variety of, of people who have violence in their lives. And thinking about how social media may impact their lives uh, was something that I really wanted to explore. So we wanted to look at really does social media in some way actually lead to physical violence? Um, so I do want to say, first off, that we all feel there are many, many positive things from social media, as Rhianda said, and uh, you know, we're not discounting that. We have such limited time to talk. We're really going to just focus on uh, certain points. So uh, really, so how does violence um, interact with social media? How does social media support self-harm and uh, the most uh, extreme of that self-harm would be suicide, so how does social media support suicide? And then I actually wanted to look at a little bit how does social media influence other violent behavior? And uh, I was actually fairly impressed by uh, the amount of data that I did find. Um, now, this, uh, there's a lot of literature, and as, uh, as Randa indicated, we're really not able to provide a lot of our literature support at, at, in the short time that we have, so we're not be, uh, you're not going to see a lot of the clinical trials that we have um, you know, reviewed to put this data. 
up. But what, I, what we have found, what I found here is that uh, in terms of violence in social media, looking at self-harm behaviors, uh, it turns out that there is literature to indicate that an increased exposure um, and, uh, to different types of methods for self-harm uh, and in uh, other ways promotion of self-harm is out there on, on social media. There's also glamorization of dangerous behaviors so that uh, individuals uh, want the thrill or the glamour or uh, the fame that is associated with performing and then posting dangerous be behaviors. Uh, by seeing a variety of dangerous behaviors that are um, posted or talked about by other individuals on social media, there is some normalization of that and also some mimicking of that behavior as well, so adoption of behavior. And then there are social media games that are really designed uh, to, uh, to, um, to trap or to, uh, uh, as part of sort of competitive behavior, encourage people to uh, self-harm. So we're going to look a little bit at some of those different aspects. When we look at um, uh, self-harm behavior, you know, the one thing we want to recognize, as was indicated before, smartphones are out there everywhere. Social media is out there. And uh, smartphones are different than what we had before with just, you know, the desk uh, computers and um, laptop computers, smartphones allow 24-7 access to social media. 95% of U.S. teenagers use a smartphone and 85% uh, use um, YouTube and then a all variety of other social media that we've already talked about. Um, there is uh, what we call non-suicidal self-injury, NSSI, and those rates are actually pretty high among youth and uh, adolescents, about 14 to 21 percent of uh, young adults in the United States um, actually uh, do undergo or, or experience uh, non-suicidal self-injury. That's where people are harming themselves, but not with the intent of killing themselves. Um, so, for example, cutting is one of those behaviors. Um, and there's literature to indicate that adolescents that do have a history of uh, non-suicidal self-injury are more active on social media than ad adolescents that don't have that type of uh, history. Um, social networking sites uh, are certainly used by self-harming youths to communicate with others to seek social support, but then they also encounter negative advice. Um, and that uh, has been demonstrated to increase the frequency of engagement in these self-harm practices. Um, there, uh, there's an increased exposure to self-harm content and behavior. There was a study of uh, videos on YouTube exploring the non-suicidal uh, self-injury uh, type of um, topic. And uh, they found that 80% uh, of those types of videos uh, actually had unrestricted access 57% lack trigger warnings, and 7% were actually pro-NSSI. Uh, so what I'm trying to point out here is that uh, individuals who have perhaps an interest or a tendency or uh, are susceptible to self-harm are able to view these different videos, and some of them actually have a pro-self-harm uh, bend, and this can uh, then really contribute to their capacity to self-harm. Um, when we think about self-harm, we also have to, re recommend, we have to remember that there are substances that people, people utilize to self-harm. And by seeing advertisements for alcohol, um, smoking, uh, marijuana, these are, are things that the adolescents and young adults are going to be bombarded with. Um, social apps for sexual behavior and hooking up for uh, anonymous partners, unsafe sex, uh, parties where uh, drugs and alcohol are utilized. That actually is something that I experienced in my practice and I, uh, I wanted to share that a couple of years ago actually uh, there was a meningitis outbreak in the uh, gay population. Um, and it turned out that there was uh, one or two apps in particular that uh, were associated that the use of these apps led to individuals hooking up and then through person-to-person -person contact 
uh, the meningitis bacteria was spread. So, um, so in that instance in particular, you know, the utilization of a social app did indeed lead to physical harm. Uh, Self-harm games, are these something that are real or a hoax? And I have to say the literature on this is really uh, very, uh, it's all over the place. But it, it is very difficult to actually uh, demonstrate that somebody has uh, either committed suicide or harmed themselves because of this. But these are just five games that are out there. The Blue Whale Challenge, this is when uh, people undertake 50 tasks in 50 days. They start out with relatively innocuous things like waking up at uh, odd hours or um, watching scary videos. And then they're supposed to do additional uh, dangerous types of behaviors leading up to indeed suicide. And in some reports that I saw, there were indeed up to 200 people that uh, were felt to have uh, killed themselves based on the blue whale challenge. Other people, other literature said, no, no, you know, that was never documented. But um, there's definitely people who have engaged in self-harming behavior uh, and uh, as part of that blue whale challenge. Choking game, salt and ice challenge, fire challenge, cutting challenge, these are all competitive self-harm behaviors where the actual self-harm is then posted and viewed and uh, individuals are basically trying to outdo each other. And these are all photos that I got off the internet uh, indicating what are these different challenges. In the middle there is the blue whale. So you have to post that you've cut yourself in the uh, pattern of a whale and then send that to your, your mentor. Um, the choking challenge, basically choke to the point of uh, developing a euphoric high, who can go longer. The salt and ice challenge, that you actually uh, burn yourself with ice that the temperature has been reduced because of the salt. Um, and then post photos of that. The flame challenge, that was really something that you actually pour flammable liquid on your torso and light it and then take a video of that. And then the, the cutting where you um, post that you've done the self-injury. So we're moving away now from uh, self-harm to actual suicide. And cyberbullying has certainly become something I think we're all familiar with. Uh, and then there's actually a new term, cyberbullicide, where the individual is so, uh, so harmed and, and um, driven to the point of suicide because of the cyberbullying. Um, there are also pro-suicidal social media sites where you can learn exactly how to kill yourself and you know, what's the most efficient way. Uh, copycat behavior can sometimes lead to additional suicides after uh, an individu individual, uh, their story becomes publicized and then there are actually internet suicide packs where suicide packs have existed for a long time, but now you can have a pack with somebody in another country or somebody you've never <laughs> met in your own country. And indeed, those suicide packs uh, have been um, well documented as actually being uh, something uh, that really happens. Cyberbullying, not uncommon. Up to 40% of all youths report experiencing it. 20% of youths actually say that they bully others through cyberspace. Uh, this is associated with higher rates of depression, low self-esteem, substance abuse, et cetera, and attempts by both the victim and the perpetrator. And it increases uh, suicidal idea ideation. Why is it so uh, such a unique challenge? Well, the humiliation uh, that can be, uh, that, that it exists is something that is permanent and available to the public. So it's no longer just happening on the, you know, the playground, for, for example, it's happening throughout the entire community. The perpetrator does not have to be physically bigger or dominant. <coughs> it can be really anybody, and it can be somebody who's anonymous. And the victim really has limited possibilities for escape or defense. Uh, two famous cases, the, the death of Phoebe Prince, a 15-year-old who, um, uh, killed herself after several months of cyberbullying by six individuals at her school. 
Uh, and this actually really brought attention to this, uh, this problem. And, um, and because of that, there was legislation that was enacted in Massachusetts as well as criminal prosecutions against the uh, six teenagers that bullied her. Um, the death of uh, Tyler Clementi, this was uh, a gay student at a college, and it really highlighted the issues of LGBTQ youth. But his roommate uh, posted a video that he had taken secretly on a webcam uh, of uh, Tyler uh, having a, a tryst with a, another individual. And then when he found out, he jumped to his death uh, three days later. And I bring up this as a second issue because this was not somebody who was bullied over months. This was just really one episode that was so traumatic, it led to his suicide. I'm, I'm not gonna go through, we're kind of running out of time, so I'm just going to uh, mention a few different things here, but there are pro-suicidal sites, message boards, chat rooms, forums, et cetera, uh, where you can learn about suicide. There was uh, something posted in Japan about uh, using hydrogen sulfide gas, and uh, about 208 people use that to successfully commit suicide. Um, this French woman, Oceane, actually became very famous and almost glamorized suicide by posting herself, uh, throwing herself under a train at the Egli uh, station in France, um, and was really saying, oh, I'm not doing this to create a buzz, but rather to make people react. So again, the glamorization of suicide. And then in South Korea, which has one of the highest suicide rates in the world, internet packs are felt to actually account for almost a third of suicides. I want to look at just one other aspect, and then I will let Helen take you into the hope and communion part, because uh, this is obviously very depressing. Um, so social media and violence, uh, actually video gaming, there's a, a body of liter literature looking at that. Of course, we've all uh, experienced issues around cults, mass shootings, et cetera. And as it turns out, gangs are using social media. So what about social media and video games, uh, violent video games in particular? Well, children, under, uh, children spend a lot of time on uh, video games. And because of the use of smartphones that allow 24-7 access, they do have access all the time. So uh, there is a well-established association between violent video games and aggressive behavior. And in fact, um, the research does demonstrate that there is decreased empathy, moral engagement, and pro-social behaviors in individuals that use uh, and play violent video games, which led the American Psychological Association in 2015 to actually issue a resolution uh, of violent video games, really looking at trying to research it better, educate people better, uh, and try to um, limit the use. With regards to gangs, uh, well, Actually, um, this, is, this is right before we get to that section, but you know, just to kind of review, uh, school shootings, I don't know if you remember, but um, in, in Finland there were uh, two different school shootings where the perpetrators used social media to share videos and statements about their intents. Um, there's been data about uh, actually uh, young women who post-sexual behavior online are more likely to then go ahead and uh, have, sec uh, have risky sexual behavior in person. Um, there have been rapes that uh, have been videoed and posted online rather than the individuals who are filming try to intervene on that person's behalf. Uh, there have been assaults that have been post-videoed and posted online as well. Uh, of course, we're all aware of the mass murderer in, in New Zealand who actually live-streamed his shootings um, as he was doing it, and that actually circulated for several hours on social media. And then Slender Man is a meme, uh, a social media meme, which was uh, felt to be responsible for two adolescents actually attacking their friend and almost killing her, uh, and then that was in Wisconsin. So, um, you know, all these things point out that 
social media and violence really can lead to physical world violence. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to uh, actually skip the gang section, but just so you know, gangs actually do use social media for a variety of activities. Um, and, you know, you can kind of read through these quickly, but, uh, you know, they, they can actually utilize social media as well for violence. Um, and in particular, I'll just show this uh, little section here. Uh, there's a tactic where um, somebody who is a target of the op opposing gang is confronted at a normal setting, like their school, et cetera, or you know, uh, uh, work or something, and then insulted or physically injured by their rival with the video capturing the event being uploaded to social media. So um, what about us? as people who are healers who deal with uh, all these types of things in our, our patients, our clients, uh, everybody that we serve. So uh, I ran into this last week, excuse the uh, high tech here, but um, I think it points out uh, that people come to us for a lot more than a prescription or for uh, you know, uh, one thing or another. They really come to us for education. They come to us to um, really uh, receive help in so many different ways. And so I feel that, you know, what, what we've brought this up is that um, we really want people in our professions to understand that there's a problem out there, question, recognize, engage, discuss, research, share, empathize with all these people that we come into uh, contact with. Clients, their families, our colleagues, social networks that we uh, participate in, professional societies like this one today, <coughs> and all the institutions that, that we work at. So, so moving on to uh, trying, trying to uplift through the, the last section of our, our presentation is Helen. All right. So one of the things that we have to underscore and understand is that the psychological and physical problems are also spiritual ones. We are a body, soul, mind unity. We are a psychosomatic unity. And in their, at their core, in their depth, um, these connect to deeper spiritual problems. I can only speak to the solutions that come from the church and that address the spiritual problems, but I can also attest, and I think uh, the, the witness of the church is that in addressing the spiritual problems, we also begin the process in the healing of the psychological and physical ones. Not that we should ever think that one alone is going to solve the entirety. We have to address them all together. Um, one of the first things that we have to ask ourselves is what, is, what are you seeking? What are you seeking in uh, this attraction of the social media? It's a, is there, it's a seeking meaning where there is none. Um, there's a sense of the loss of the worth of oneself and of others expressed in isolation and violence. It's coming out in these, in these ways. Um, and I'm also going to address the problem that arises from the way social media freezes us in moments of time and leads to psychological and social and spiritual imprisonment, where every imperfection, every failure um, becomes fixed. All right, can social media be a spiritual uh, addiction? Where do we find meaning? Is it designed to be spiritually addictive? I'm going uh, to be addictive. I'm going to address these points. Uh, can it separate us from each other? How does it do that? Can it separate us from God? I want to say that the photos with um, the children and the adults there come from our families. One comes from Randa's family and one comes from my sister and myself when we were at a family reunion. I do this because, okay, so those are kids watching the Super, the Bowl? Super Bowl. Okay, and they're watching it on their phones. No, <laughs> no? they're playing on their phones. Oh, they're playing on their the phones. Super Bowl's right in front oh, of them. Oh, right, and they're together, but they're not together. 
This down here on, on the left is a family reunion, okay? <laughs> and there's a pool out there, all right? And every one of those adults who are close family members, okay? I, I took that picture because I, I walked out of the, of the thing to go out to the pool and I was like, what? <laughs> so, but the point is, it's not over there, it's right here. Okay. It's next to us. It is, it is among us. Um, the idea of being separated from God, I couldn't think of a better picture than, than the, the zombies walking with the, with the phones. Because really, when we separate from God, we die. And what does that lead? It leads us to a living death, a continuing living death. As Randa had pointed out that... Uh, Social uh, uh, studies have shown that increased time on social media is linked to increased depression and anxiety, loneliness, discontent, and envy. The data is conflicting, though, because we see that there is some increased connection and happiness associated with some uses of social media. So the problem really lies with this sense that um, the time spent was meaningless. So when it corresponds with the lack of meaningful engagement, that then we find that the time spent on social media um, indeed um, causes this terrible discontent content and loneliness. It has been expressed before, however, <laughs> that what we really seek when we are striving to gain the world is really God. And, and I have a quote from Pascal here, one of our favorites, uh, I think, among theologians. What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness of which now all that remains is the empty pint, uh, print and trace? This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with the infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God. We have a God-shaped hole, right? And St. Augustine says, our, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. But social media uh, is actually designed to be addictive to try to fill this hole. And honestly, one of the church fathers had said, if we had an infinite amount of time, we would try to fill this hole with everything, and we would finally figure out that nothing will fill it, and we would get it, and we would all you know, fill it with God. But we don't, and so we have a short period here, and we are filling it with, with things, but social media is in fact designed, and the former Facebook president, Sean Parker, in speaking about Facebook and how they purposely designed it, he said that the thought process that went into building these social networks, Facebook being the first of them to really understand it, okay, was how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible? Uh, we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content and that's going to get you more likes and more contents and comments and it builds. So it is designed to be addictive, to design to appeal to our need to be valued and loved, to fill uh, a sense of meaning in our lives. Spiritual addiction is something the church has a long and wise history addressing. And honestly, there's a great deal of overlap between the wisdom of the church and how to um, peel away from our deep connections to the addictive elements of social media. A classic formulation of the, of the process of addiction is articulated by St. Neil Sorsky, but it, you can look at many different locations. He's a, a, he's a Russian from the 15th, late 15th century. Um, but that which is simple, a suggestion, an innocent uh, activity, something that doesn't bear any moral weight to it is presented. One dialogues with it. You begin to entertain it, to welcome it into your sphere, right? 
you then consent or you give your, your will and your attention and uh, actually begin to move in some way to actuate your, uh, uh, what that thought or presentation or, or thing is, t is talking to you about. But this moves into the captivity of the heart when in fact the heart, the interest, the uh, attention isn't even necessarily consciously willing it, but is uh, becoming enveloped with it and it's persistent and you're preoccupied. And then it becomes a passion. It is something that becomes part second nature in your life. You can't live without it. And indeed, we, we heard at, at a different uh, uh, lecture today, take away the kid's cell phone and they're like, you've taken away my life. You've taken away my life. Um, so how do we address spiritual addiction? And sometimes I want to say a spiritual affliction because addiction is really, it's a disease, it's an affliction. Um, we have processes within the church that offer hope and ultimately communion. And Deacon Perry had said something yesterday in his lecture that the, that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, but uh, personal relation. I think that's what you said, communion communion. Exactly what the church says. <laughs> the church offers throughout its history the triumvirate of fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. But I want us to expand our understanding of what those things are, okay? That's the classic articulation of remedies for uh, spiritual illness. But when you talk about fasting, you want to talk about all the different kinds of spiritual and physical discipline that we uh, engage in that limits and regulates behavior to restore healthy behavior, okay, to get us functioning in, a, in the way that really leads to our health, that restores connection to God and each other. Um, worship is included in prayer, and, and prayer and worship is precisely the restoration of communion, dialogue, and, and we'll talk about that briefly when we... And then finally, um, uh, almsgiving, and I definitely want us to understand almsgiving in a much more broader uh, way as um, really all the ways in which we express our loving care for one another. Um, now, just moving straight first to um, address the importance of fasting, and that it means the regulation of uh, practices that then lead to the regulation of our behaviors so that they are spiritually healthy. I want to emphasize that in the mind of the church, this is never about becoming, you know, newly obsessed with the action of discipline. It has the purpose of liberating the heart from its disordered desires or passions. It's, it's been attached to things in a way that um, has obscured your true desire, your true love. And when that has been sort of, you know, if you've been detached from that, you're liberated and now you can really love. And the classic language for this is apathia, or being liberated or free from passions, okay, leads to agapi. That moves you into love. It doesn't lead you to a place where you have nothing. Now you have the possibility for real love and communion as opposed to the stuff that was filling you up, uh, that you tried to fill your up, yourself up with that was just garbage. Um, so one of the thought suggestions was to fast from cell phone use, usage. And um, so I brought these up too because uh, on the internet I found this lovely little thing, what would happen if we treated our prayer rope like our cell phone? So <laughs> prayer rope or cell phone. <laughs> and by the way, I've often heard we can't use these as, as fashion accessories, okay? They're on our wrists so we can take them off and pray them. Uh, pray them. They're not there to be worn because they're part of the fashion of the day, okay. 
But what if we carried it around with us? What if we went through it several times a day, uh, et cetera? What if we used it when we traveled and used it in the case of an emergency? What a thought. Um, but certainly to put down the cell phone, pick up the prayer rope. And I'm going to move now into the aspect of prayer. Hope and communion, what the church offers to heal isolation and violence is really discovering true meaning in connecting with our, our, each other in God in prayer. St. John Climacus in his um, Letter of Divine Ascent, Step 28 says, prayer is by nature a dialogue in a union of man with God, communion. But then he goes on to say, its effect is to hold the world together it achieves a reconciliation with God. This is the overcoming of isolation. When we overcome the isolation that's occurring within us, it impacts the way, it, it, can, it can spread out and, and um, overcome the isolation outside of us. We strive to begin to be the ones who, in prayer, communicate with God, and then through communion, and in worship, we build liturgically. It's the, the liturgy really is the expression of the building up of the kingdom of, of God, a community, a people, a body. You can't get any more communion than that, right? Um, it's the movement, and again, I'm echoing what, what uh, Deacon Terry said yesterday, the movement, though, from isolation to eternal communion and we become communion. We become the body of Christ, we become communion. We also do this by becoming a community through during, uh, doing worship. Doing worship is doing mercy. Because what is expressed in the worship of the church is the love of God for his people, the offering of himself to his people, and we becoming that self-offering to the world. So really, the doing of worship is the doing of mercy. It's coming out into the world and sharing our love, care for the sick, visiting the lonely, feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger. And I said welcoming the stranger for this, because it's, they're in baptismal gowns, by the way. They're, they're new converts. And she's got a whole sleeve, a tattoo sleeve, OK? And I'm just saying. From a lot of Orthodox churches that I know, that's the stranger, okay? And we need to welcome all, kind, all people. If you don't know the story of St. Moses, the Ethiopian, and the bag of sand, look it up. But when it comes to do not judge others, that's a classic story. Please look it up, okay? And um, we have here, and I want us to think of Christ on the cross with his arms stretched out, he looked from the cross and he saw a suffering humanity and he reached his arms out, right, to embrace that humanity. So who are we? We are the body of Christ. We are the body of that crucified Christ reaching out in self-offering to embrace a suffering humanity. And this is the way we heal from isolation and violence. We offer this reality. Um, this is the mercy that we are to do. Finally, liberation from that frozen in sin past, okay? We have the possibility of being defined by who will we, we will become, not who we were. The church is what we call eschatological. Um, truth is revealed in the person of Christ and that will become fully revealed at the end times. And so the future, who will we become, um, is truly our authentic self. We are liberated to be that through baptism and then through confession, which is a second baptism, a blotting out of sin, a new creation. And as I'll quote from scripture, we who truly are is who we become in Christ. That's not scripture, but that's me. Okay, it has not yet uh, been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. And 
I do want to point out Orthodox confession. Classic one is, of course, Christ is the one who gives us uh, renewal. So the priest is the hand of Christ there. He does The priest doesn't do it. Christ is doing it. But he does us a, our companion. Confession is the sacrament of reconciliation, being reunited to the body of Christ, restoration of communion. It is reconciliation. So the opposites, the isolated ones, are now restored to communion. And that occurs through this loving embrace that really occurs in confession. So I do want us to remember that the church fathers, looking at the secular world, did not reject everything of the secular world. And we can't do that with social media either. There are ways in which we can baptize social media so that it becomes, in fact, an asset or a way of serving the Lord. And here are just some suggestions. Intentional enhancement of education and communication. Ways of facilitating service to others. I'm thinking of the meal trains that are, are put out or um, uh, prayer groups through online uh, prayer, you know, asking for prayers. It can facilitate, facilitate worship for shut-ins, uh, streaming services. But the important thing is to enhance and not to replace, and, and, and Randa had mentioned that. So that's my part, and our hope was to have a few minutes to talk about um, assessing and, and, and creating a, maybe an assessment tool. So I'm gonna... Can I, can I take two minutes? Sure. Okay, all right. So being that this is a workshop and you know, we've I mean, we had hopefully useful information for you to digest, um, but we also wanted you to leave thinking about how you would apply it in your practice, whatever that is, um, whether that be um, in the medical or psychological or um, pastoral care. Um, and so, you know, we gave you some sample questions, again, that were adapted from actual assessment tools to look at how um, the people you work with are using social media, um, and you can look at the actual <coughs> references to see the entire assessment tools. But we wondered, given the impact of social media on our spiritual lives when we use it excessively, what kind of questions could we ask to assess the impact of social media on our spiritual life? So we just kind of wanted to throw that question out to you. Come on, wake up, wake up. <laughs> If you were asking someone you were work, working with, um, you know, what what kind of question, what would it look like? Um, for example, I thought of a couple, uh, if I were writing an assessment tool. Do you ever peek at your phone in the middle of liturgy? Do you use the Bible app on your phone, spend two minutes on that, and then 20 minutes checking your email? Do you even finish reading, or does an alert pop up and interrupt you? So those were the kinds of questions we were thinking that maybe as a group we could um, we could brainstorm. I don't know. Maybe you're all just done. But does anyone have any thoughts like that? So sometimes I, I know personally on Facebook there's a lot of wonderful Orthodox uh, groups and chats and things that are great, but sometimes as you're going from one meaningful quote to the next that can occupy a lot of time and, and, and bandwidth and nothing really lands. So I think sometimes our ability to kind of uh, do a lot of reading and not a lot of integrating. So when there's this sort of this thing where we go down that, you know, we call it the wiki wormhole where you're on right, Wikipedia, right. but there's that orthodox wiki wormhole where you're just reading and reading and nothing's really landing and you're just kind of feeding yourself to get fed. Now, is there a question that could come out of that? I don't sure, know. Sure, sure. Yeah. How about something like, um, do you find yourself skimming Orthodox material uh, or spiritual material with the intent of, um, of applying it, but instead you don't know, stop and reflect? Right. Um, you know, it's, it's ac actually interesting. There's a lot of studies that are done that show that reading on a computer uh, you remember less than if you read in print, and it's because we are constantly scrimming. We, we are a scrolling society. We don't stop and reflect anymore. Um, so maybe a question around, uh, yeah, 
how how much you actually intentionally reflect. I like the word scroll. I, yeah. yeah, I think yeah. I think that's the phenomenon. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, I notice in my own life that that social media can kind of the the easiest place for it to come in is in transition times in general. Yes. But one is especially like. Uh, going to pray for the evening, I'll just check Facebook first, and then my, what was supposed to be five minutes, and then like brush my teeth and I'm in bed, turns into 20 minutes on that, and then all of a sudden like the, the whole evening's thrown off when I go to pray, is it's not as uh, fervent because I'm just trying to get through it because I was supposed to be in bed 10 minutes ago. Um, and I, I presented that over the summer to the youth I was working with, and it seemed to resonate pretty strongly, so. Yeah, so but. something like to you, uh, spend do you I don't know do you spend more time online you know than you intended in a way that disrupts your prayer time or maybe something, something like that. that yeah something like that yeah I don't know I don't know the best wording for the question but something along those lines Great. thank you thank you how many hours a week have you lost or have been impacted in terms of sleep through your social media media use uh, particularly teenagers who will get text messages, answer stuff, they'll put it under their pillows, wake up in the middle of the night, right. and so ways that we, you know, I think sleep is a huge impact, uh, even just blue light, so there's definitely some questions there. Absolutely, and we know the research shows that um, the amount of time spent on so social media is related to um, sleep loss, and then we know that that is related to an increase in depression as well, lots of studies on that. I think of two things just in my work uh, in chaplaincy and palliative care in particular. One is, or even just friends and family who are going through serious illness and like sites like Caring Bridge and Facebook groups, you know, things which can be so positive but also um, maybe present a snapshot of illness or if someone has like a life-threatening illness, you know, their thoughts about it, but it sort of maybe prevents you from actually reaching out to them in real life because you feel like, well, I'm getting emailed like a caring bridge update about them. So I wonder, so I think just how we think about that. And secondly, I distinctly recall, uh, I had a patient in the ICU uh, as the chaplain for that, the, this, I'm, I'm one of the ICUs where a young woman had had a brain bleed and was, was clinically dead and was going to be, you know, taken off life support and her fiance all he could do in the room, I, you know, she's just been declared brain dead. The only thing he could think about was trying to get into her Facebook page and like to navigate. He was worried that someone was going to post something on social media about her death, like his cousins knew about it or something. And he, I mean, he was on the computer and his fiance is there in this ICU bed intubated, you know, <coughs> and kind of, and all it, it was just so it was just so painful to see because I worry about the impact on grief, um, and was he even able to be present with her? I mean, I understand him wanting to kind of keep things, you know, to to prevent any further communication or let not let the word get out. But it, it was like just he heartbreaking, lost view sort of, of his to priority see priority in the moment. Yeah, which we know, you know, I think Paul was saying we fill all of our time, all of our blank spaces with our online use and in and in that situation you know and maybe it was too hard for him to yeah, just really be with powerful. her in her illness that way um but certainly yeah that's that's a distraction right very so. nice presentation uh i actually have something positive to say about uh social media and my spiritual life um, I've, I've downloaded the daily reading app on my phone and I learn about saints that I never knew about. I learn about, um, apologeticons that I never knew about. Um, so it's enriched my spiritual life and I'm able to look at it in those transition times. Personally, I'm not an electronics person. I hate reading on the screen. It gives me a headache. So I'm not, I wouldn't say like I'm addicted to my phone or electronic things, but for me, this is a very pleasant way of experiencing electronics um, through, our, through the daily reading app. Also in the youth group that I run at my church, I say, hey, why don't you guys download the daily reading app? Or, hey, let's look up who your patron saint is. And um, I'm having them use their social media uh, with, with a spiritual um, side to it. Also, uh, the other part of it that's been positive for me is I do go on, I'm on those Orthodox posts, somebody mentioned that. 
And for whatever saint it is for that day, um, I stop and I'm like, oh, something real. And it actually has the opposite effect of what somebody else said. I actually stop what I'm doing and pay really close attention because most of it is like, oh, look, they went to the football game or, oh, look, they went, you know, da, 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 I'm just scrolling. That's when I'm scrolling. But when I hit the saint and then a lot of times if you press on it, it'll tell you the life of the saint. Then I'm like, something good for the day. And I read it, and I pay attention to it. It makes me feel good like nothing else that I look at on Facebook. So it's actually been very positive in my experience. And, and you've been able to use it um, a little more intentionally, it exactly. sounds like. And, and in part also probably because you're not an electronics person, exactly. as you said. Right? Right. So yeah. those who are have, yeah. that, have that issue. But again, yeah. um, how you use it makes all the difference exactly. and again I don't know if I even officially cited him but it was John Cassialpo's research from the University of Chicago who was very clear if you are using it to enhance your social connections mm -hmm. it's a good thing right. if you are using it to replace them it's not now mm -hmm. You're reading and you're learning, that's great. If you use that in place of going to church, not so great, right? right? So yeah, yeah, right. I know you're not, I know you're not. <laughs> so, are we done? Yeah, that's uh, good. Yeah. Great. so I just want to thank uh, Kathy and Helen and Randa for a wonderful presentation. We hope to talk a lot more about it. In the <laughs>